السلام عليكم ورحمة الله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله الذي العظيم الحمد لله رب العالمين صلى الله على سيدنا ونبينا عبد القاسم المصطفى محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين لا سيما بقية الله في العظيم أجل الله تعالى فرجه الشريف وجعلنا من أعمالي وأنصاره اللهم أخرجني من ظلمات الوهم وأكرمني بنور الفهم اللهم افتح علينا أبواب رحمتك وانشر علينا خزائن علومك برحمتك يا أرحم الراحم Trusting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and asking for his help and guidance, we start our third session on lessons on Islamic beliefs. As usual, we start with hadith about knowledge. قَالَ مُعَوِيَةُ بْنُ عَمَّارِ لِلصَّادِقَ عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامِ The narrator called Muawiyah, the son of Ammar, asked Imam Sadiq about two types of people. A person who knows the hadith of Ahlul Bayt, knows the teachings of the Ahlul Bayt, and spreads it among the people, and as a result, the faith in the heart of the Mu'mineen will become stronger. And a worshipper, who is also a Shia, a follower of Ahlul Bayt, dedicated his life to worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But he is not engaged in spreading the hadith of Ahlul Bayt and teaching of Ahlul Bayt. Which one is better? Is the narrator of hadith better or the worshipper is better? And the answer that maybe you expect is either both, or maybe you say that the narrator of hadith is better. But the answer of Imam is not that they are equal, it's not that the narrator of hadith is better, it's more than that. So listen carefully to see what is the answer of Imam. So, قَالَ مُعَوِيَةُ بْنُ عَمَّارِ لِلصَّادِقَ عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامِ رَجُلٌ رَاوِيَةٌ لَحَدِيثَكُمْ There is a person who narrates a lot. Those of you who have studied Arabic, you know that sometimes in Arabic, فَاعِلَة is used for سِغِي مُبَالِغَة So, رَاوِيَة should be for female, but here it's سِغِي مُبَالِغَة رَجُلٌ رَاوِيَةٌ is a man who narrates a lot. Your hadith, Raviya al hadithakum, Yabuthullah al kafirnas. He spreads your hadith, your teachings among people. Wa yushadiduhu fi qulubihim wa qulub shi'atikum. He makes those hadith settle nicely and smoothly in the hearts of people and the heart of your Shia. Many times in our hadith, when you come across the term Nas, refers to non-Shia. For example, when Imam Razali said, Lo alima nasu mahasana kalamana lattabuna. Nas means the majority, which means non-Shia. Sunni Muslims, Sunni brothers. Sometimes Nas can be non-Muslims. So it's non-Shia, either non-Shia among Muslims or non-Shia who are not also Muslims. Anyway, يُشَدِّدُهُ فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ He makes those hadiths settle and established deeply in the heart of those people, Nas, the public. وَقُلُوبَ شِيَعْتَكُمْ And also in the hearts of your Shia. وَلَعَلَّ عَابِدًا مِنْ شِيَعَتِكُمْ لَيْسَتْ لَهُ هَذِهِ الرَّوَايَةِ And maybe there is also a worshipper from your Shia 
who doesn't have this <coughs> habit of spreading and sharing your hadith. Ayyuhuma afdal. Which one is better? Qal. The Imam Al-Islam said, Arraviyatu l-hadithina. The one who repeatedly narrates our hadith. Yashuddu bihi quloob shi'atina. And he makes the heart of the, our Shia strong. Afwal, he is better min alf abd. From 1,000 worshippers, not just from one worshipper. You ask me whether he is better or worshipper, I tell you he is better than 1,000 worshippers. So you see the difference. It's something of a different quality, something of a different nature. It's wrong to compare them. Of course, when we say narrate the hadith, it doesn't mean just open a book of hadith and start reading. It should come with understanding of the hadith, with the knowledge of hadith, as we have many hadith, that your concern should not be just narrating, your concern should be also understanding. Because we have Rewayatul Hadith and we have Dirayatul Hadith. A person who knows Hadith knows which one is strong, which was not strong, which is good to be shared, which is not good to be shared. So you need lots of skills, you need art of understanding and sharing Hadith. Anyway, a person who is well acquainted with the teachings of Ahlul Bayt and spread it among the people, and as a result, increases their faith and their love for Ahlul Bayt, this person is better than 1,000 worshippers. The next hadith, again from Imam Sadr Ali Salam, مَا مِنْ أَحَدٍ يَمُوتُ مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ أَحَبَّ إِلَىٰ إِبْلِيسِ مِنْ مَوْتِ فَقِيهِ When a mu'min dies, Satan becomes happy. Because every mu'min is a challenge for Satan. Every mu'min is a soldier for the opposite camp. So when a mu'min dies, Iblis is happy. But among the mu'mineen, no one's death makes Satan happy like death of an al, a faqih. A person who has deep understanding of Islam and not only benefits himself with his knowledge but also benefits people with his knowledge. When a faqih, when an alim, a true alim dies, then for shaitan, shaitan, Iblis is a big feast. Ma min ahadin yamutu min al There is no one who dies from believers. Ahabba ila Iblis, more lovable to Iblis than the death of Faqih. Nowadays, when we say Faqih, we understand a jurist, a mujtahid. But literally, originally, Faqih meant someone who had deep understanding of Islam, not necessarily only in Fiqh. Okay, inshallah, we would have more hadith in. Inshallah, future. Now let's start our discussion. Alhamdulillah, we already covered Tawheed and Adl, unity of God and divine justice. The third principle, as you know, is prophethood and Nabuwa. In the books on theology, on Kalam, we have two discussions. One is what we call an nubuwwatul ammah and the second is an nubuwwatul khassa general prophethood and a specific prophethood general prophethood is to believe in the fact that God has provided humanity throughout the centuries throughout the ages with prophets God has guided humanity through revelation. 
We believe in all prophecies. We believe in all scriptures. We believe in all instances of revelation. This is Al-Nubuwatul Am. And inshallah I will explain it further. But Al-Nubuwatul Khasa, a specific prophethood, refers to the prophethood of a specific prophet. For example, for us, we have to believe in the mission and the message of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So not only we should believe in the general principle of Nabuwa and prophethood, we should also specifically believe in this particular prophet. It's not enough to say, I believe in all the prophets. You have to know that prophet that you need to know, you need to believe, you need to follow. It's very important. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent 124,000 prophets. We believe in all of them, but we don't need to know all of them one by one. But that prophet that is the prophet of our generation, the prophet that we have to follow, you have to identify him. You have to know him specifically. You cannot say, I know there is a prophet. No, you have to know him particularly. So this is why our ulama discuss nubuwa in two levels. An nubuwa al amma and an nubuwa al khasa. The same is with imama. We have al imama al amma to believe in the fact that there must be people in every generation who would be responsible for comprehensive leadership, whether it be for worldly affairs or for religious affairs, the idea of Imam in general. But also we have to specifically believe in the Imam of our age. So this is a specific Imam. So now let's go back to Nubuwa. First we start with General Nubuwa. We believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has provided all creatures with some kind of guidance. It's not only human beings, it's not even only animals. Everything that God has created, God also has given it its due guidance. Pharaoh asked Musa alayhi salam, and Harun alayhi salam wa man rabbukuma ya Musa who is your lord o Musa Musa alayhi salam said rabbuna alladhi a'ta kull shay'in khalqahu thumma hada our lord is the one who has given everything its due creation then guided them so God has not just created, God has created and guided. So anything in this world which has a potential for growth, for development, for perfection, there is a principle put inside it that helps it in finding its way towards its development. It can be seed, it can be a flower, it can be a tree, it can be an insect, it can be an animal, it can be human beings. So everything, depending on its capacity, has received sufficient guidance. It's a general principle. Also we have in Surah A'la, الَّذِي خَلَّقَ فَصَوَّى وَالَّذِي قَدَّرَ فَحَدَى God is the one who created and made the creation complete and he measured and then guided. Qaddara fahada. So, it's a general principle. God is providing every creature with guidance. Okay? But, when it comes to human beings, guidance is not only one form. We have multiple Forms of guidance. We have guidance through our instincts. 
like animals. But not just this, we have more. Animals, most of the time, they rely on instincts. And therefore, their instincts are stronger than us. They can know many, many things just by instinct. For example, even they can know how to make their shelter by instinct. Bees know how to make their hive by instinct. How to make birds know how to make their nests by instinct. How to look after their children by instinct. We don't know these things by instinct. We have to learn. But for them, because there is no alternative way, everything is provided through instincts. But we have instincts. We have intellect. Many things we understand by our intellect and animals don't understand them. They understand very little. In some discussions, I don't want to get into that discussion, but in some other places I have said that animals don't develop knowledge of future. Animals are focused on the present and they may have short memory of the past. Short memory. There is no such thing as going back to history. For animal, history starts with themselves. <laughs> For a horse, history starts with itself. <laughs> Nothing earlier than itself. The maximum an animal can go back is early days or early minutes of its life, depending on how long the life of that animal would be. But go generations back, go and discover, I don't know, perished nations. This is not interesting to animals. And certainly nothing about future. For animals, future is not important. They are very focused on the present. And they are very focused on this place. Animals don't bother what is happening in the rest of the world. What is important for them, what is happening right now, right here. And then you can see, sometimes we become very close to animals. When we forget the history and future, and we forget what happens to other people in other parts of the world. So now, we are very close to that instant and limited knowledge that animals have. Anyway, animals don't draw lessons for future from their current experiences. If you see, for example, an animal who makes, for example, shelter, this shelter today and the shelter which this animal or progeny of this animal are going to make next year or after 10 years or after 50 years would be the same. You don't see any improvement and you don't see any decline. Everything is the same. They don't reflect on the way they do things so that they can improve. If you look at the for example, nests of the birds today and 100 years ago, you don't see any improvement. Industrial revolution has not affected them. <laughs> Everything is the same. For us, we keep thinking, we keep coming up with theories, we generalize. For an animal to look at something is enough to trigger that animal. For example, a cat, when it's hungry and sees a mouse, that's enough. By instinct, goes after the mouse. There is no process of thinking, reflecting, consulting, making phone calls, asking people, should I do this, shouldn't I do this? No, just it's triggered. 
and no lessons to take. So they don't develop as skills, they don't develop you know, sciences. Anyway, for them everything is through instincts, for us instincts are more limited, therefore we are in need of developing sciences, we are in need of developing skills, we are in need of asking, learning, reflecting. But there are many things that neither our instincts nor our sciences would be sufficient to introduce to us. And even if they can introduce to us, they can be coming with doubts and hesitations. Therefore, we need something very clear, very strong, very specific, and that is revelation. So revelation is to help us with understanding those things that we were not able to understand by ourselves. Teaches you, the Prophet teaches you what you were not able to know. Also, to remind us of what we were able to know, but maybe we had forgotten. And also, to clarify those things that are controversial. Some people have one opinion, some people have another opinion. Religion comes and gives us clear, specific answer. Also, religion comes and provides us with sanction. There are many people who know that they shouldn't tell lies. They shouldn't hurt other people. They shouldn't break their promises. But their moral sense of responsibility might not be enough to make them pious and virtuous in their life. There are many people that you need to remind them of the possibility of going to hell and still maybe they choose to be moral and virtuous. You know, some people, even if they know that there is punishment, still they don't bother. But if we had no reward and no punishment and we're just going to act according to our moral understanding, out of our own motivation, many, many people would not be that strong to still act according to their principles. When they are challenged, they would have compromised. When they have to pay a cost for being moral, they would have compromised. So religion gives us more determination, provides us with sanction, so that what you know, you would take it very seriously. So we need revelation, not as a replacement for reason. No, we need reason as well. Both of them are needed. It's not either reason or revelation. No, we need both. This ayah is very beautiful that لو كنا نسمع ونعقل You have it in the book. Verse 9 of chapter 67. قَالُوا بَلَا قَدْ جَاءَنَا نَذِيرٌ فَكَذَّبْنَا وَقُلْنَا مَا نَزَّلَ اللَّهُ مِنْ شَيْءٍ أَنْ تُمِلْنَا فِي ضَلَالٍ كَبِيرٌ And then it says بَقَالُوا لَوْ كُنَّا نَسْمَعُ أَوْ نَعْقِلْ مَا كُنَّا فِي أَصْحَابِ السَّعِيرٌ Had we listened or we have thought properly we would not have been put among the people of hell. So why we have ended up with being in hell? Because we didn't listen and we didn't think. Nasma'u means listen to the revelation and to the revealed guidance, transmitted guidance in the form of revelation. Or in the form of hadith and sunnah, which is the exemplification of the revelation. If we were listening to the prophets and imams, or we were thinking, 
using our intellect, we were saved. We didn't follow revelation and we didn't follow reason, therefore we are misguided. We are not saved. So, reason is needed. Revelation is also needed. I would like to share with you an analogy, which is not in the book. But I think it's a useful analogy. Some people think that reason is like a key for entering religion. Without reason, you cannot get, to get into religion. Because how do you prove that this religion is true? How do you pr prove that this man is a true prophet? How do you prove that God exists? How do you prove that Quran is word of God? You cannot say, I believe Quran is word of God because of the Quran. You have to have independent reason for that. That's rational argument. So, some people say, reason brings us to religion. Like a key by which you unlock the door and open the door. When you get into the door, into, sorry, into the room, do you need the key? No. So, we say, this is not a good analogy. Because we need reason also inside the room. And we see today in the world, when people use reason to come to religion, but then say goodbye to reason when they are in religion, what happens? Disasters happen. When people are not understanding and implementing their religion rationally, Disasters can happen. Tragedies can happen. We need reason prior to coming to religion and also when we are religious. And this is why in Shia Islam, reason for us is also one of the sources for understanding our religion. And even in Fiqh, we have Abdul as one of our four resources. Anyway, so this analogy is not perfect, it's not complete. It is good that the reason is like a key, but it's not all a story, it's just part of the story. Some people have said that the reason for religion is like a scale by which you weigh and measure. A scale, you know, a scale, mizan. In Farsi, we say tarazu. A scale, yeah? So they say, when you are presented with something, use your angle and measure it. For example, they tell you something superstitious, present it to your angle, angle says, don't accept it. Yeah? There are many things that angle says, don't accept it. You say, okay, this is good. If there is something against Aql, we don't accept it. But there are many things that are not against Aql, they are above Aql. In Islam, we don't have anything against reason, but we have things which are above reason. And don't be surprised, reason is one of the ways of understanding. Even in our normal day-to-day -day life, there are many things that we understand, but not through reason. It can be through your perceptions. If you want to know how many people are in this room, you cannot use your apple and come up with a philosophical argument to say how many people are in this room. You know, philosophers have a rule, they say, al you cannot use particulars in order to develop an argument or in order to move towards them as a conclusion. Deduction works only with universal concepts. So there is no way that a philosopher can sit somewhere and use his intellect and 
for example, decide what is the measure of this room, how many people are in this room, it's not working. During medieval ages, some people try to do these things. So they were trying to count the teeth of a horse through philosophy. <laughs> Instead of going and counting the teeth of the horse, they used to you know, argue with other philosophy. This is wrong. Or for example, if you want to understand what is the taste of a food, like biryani, you cannot use philosophy. You have to taste it. What is the fragrance of rose flower or jasmine? You cannot understand it through philosophy. So, there are things that we can understand through other channels of understanding. They are not against reason, but they are outside the scope of reason. Revelation gives us access to many, many facts which are not against reason. We don't accept anything against reason. We don't accept anything contradictory to reason. But there are things that reason is just silent. For example, when religion introduces to us the details of hell and heaven, it's not something that your adult can have any say. There is no judgment, there is no ruling for Abel here, because Abel has no access. Or for example, your Abel tells you that you have to serve your Creator. But can Abel tell you that how many times a day you have to say your prayer? And how you have to say your prayer? When you need to fast? How you should fast? Whether you need to go to Mecca for Hajj or not? The ways and methods of serving God cannot be understood by Abel. Abel tells you, you have to serve God, you have to worship. But how, how much, when, where, you can't get it from Abel. So, we don't have anything against Abel, we don't have anything contradictory to Abel, but we have many things which are above Abel. Or if it is in ordinary knowledge, next to Atla, or lower than Atla, like perception. Revelation gives us access to the things which are above Atla, like knowledge about the unseen world, knowledge about God, about angels. We can understand through Atla something about God, but not everything. Imagine if you were just a philosopher, could you ever dream of coming through philosophy to Du'aya Joshan Akabir, or Du'aya Abu Hamza Thumani, or Du'aya Arafat? No philosopher has ever produced even one page of Du'a like this. Yes, they can say, O Wajibul Wujud, O the first mover, O uncaused cause, that's it. There is no way to talk to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the way that you find in the religious scripture, in liturgy, in supplications. This intimate relation with God is something that philosophy cannot provide you with. Philosophy gives you framework, gives you principles, but that detailed and personal account of God. This is given through revelation. So we need both. It's not either reason or revelation. We say we need both of them. So a scale is not also a good analogy. What was the first analogy? Key. The second? A scale. None of them is perfect. The third analogy is that reason is like a torch. Gives you light to get into religion and also helps you inside religion. But when you are inside religion, you can have other sources of light, which can be much stronger than torch. So, we always need this light 
but we can increase our light when we are inside the realm of religion. Okay, so we need revelation. In the book, there are some discussions why we need revelation. Why, for example, science is not enough. Why humanities are not enough. Why psychology, sociology are not enough. I have explained that each of these sciences are very limited. And even in each of them, you have different schools that they disagree even about the fundamental issues. Even about the methodology, they may disagree. About their... Uh, metaphysical principles they may disagree. If you have studied psychology, you know there are many schools in psychology. There are many schools in sociology. And we see that how people, even in the 20th century, 21st century, who seem to be following science, they have lots of differences when it comes to their social, moral life. Even people in different Western countries, they have different constitutions. They have different penal codes. They have different norms. In some countries, you know, they say abortion is not permissible. In some countries, it's permissible. There are many differences. So science is not enough. Science doesn't give you answer for everything. And even those areas that science can help, it doesn't give you a specific answer, clear answer. But there are many things that you cannot answer scientifically. You need to have something more. So, we need revelation. What we understand from the Quran is that God has dispatched to all nations messengers. لَقَدْ بَعَثْنَا فِي كُلَّ أُمَّةٍ رَسُولًا أَنْ يَعْبُدُ اللَّهَ وَاجْتَنِبُ الطَّاعُودِ We have dispatched to all nations a messenger. To tell people to serve God and avoid the devil. There is no nation in the world that has not been given a prophet. All the nations, from the east to the west, from the north to the south, all the nations have been given prophets. We are not saying every generation. No, every nation, every nation has been given prophets. But how many prophets are given to them? We don't have a detailed list of this many prophets have been sent to Asia, this many prophets have been sent to Africa, this many people have been sent to Europe. We don't have the list. Even we don't know how the population of the world was divided and distributed. But what we know is لَقَدْ بَعَثْنَا فِي كُلُّ أُمَّةٍ رَسُولًا Allah has sent to all nations messengers. The Quran doesn't give us the number of prophets, but according to some hadith, there were 124,000 prophets. 124,000. We know some of them by name, not even half of them, not even one-fifth of them. In the Quran we have about maybe 25 of them mentioned by name. Even the Quran says there are many of them that we have not mentioned their stories to you. But what we see in the world is that you see traces of teachings of the prophets all over the world. You see, there are many common teachings, many common understandings of moral values all over the world, partly because of their fitra and partly because of the teachings of the prophets. Another thing that we know is that every prophet spoke the language of the people to whom he was sent. مَا أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ رَسُولٍ إِلَّا بِاللِّسَانِ قَوْمِهِ No prophet was in need of interpreter. Okay? Every prophet was sent to the people that he was able to communicate to them directly. 
So this is very important. Also, we know that the prophets adjusted their level of discourse according to the understanding of people. نَحْنُ مَعَاشِرَ الْأَنْبِيَاءِ This hadith. نُكَلَّمُ النَّاسَ عَلَىٰ قَدْرَ أُقُولِهِمْ We prophets speak to people according to the level of their intellect. The prophets never confused people. This is a very important lesson for everyone. Those who have access to member, those who have access to public platforms. If they want to follow the example of the prophets, they should know, no matter how much you know or how much you think you know, because many times you may not know actually, but no matter how much you know, you have to speak in the way that when your lecture finishes, people can go out with peace of mind, with clarity, with more orientation, not that you confuse people, and when people go out, they have to struggle so that they can go back after difficulty to the state that they used to be before listening to you. What a disaster is that if a speaker comes to a community and makes them confused and perplexed, and then when he goes away or people go away, they have to spend lots of time to again bring things back to the order. It's like someone who comes to your home and misplaces everything. You cannot find, you know, where is your, I don't know, uh, belongings, where are your belongings? You have to spend time to sort out everything. In the end, many things may still remain missing. So, prophets with all the knowledge that they had, they spoke in the way that average people very easily understood them. They had things for people who were more profound, more intelligent, but not by making the cost of it confusion of other people. You know, a prophet never talked to the elites only. It's very important. The prophet didn't address the elites only. The prophet addressed a nas, masses of people. But the elite enjoyed and benefited more than the average. But even the average could understand them. It's very important. So the hadith says, we, prophets, speak to people according to the level of their understanding. I always remember this story about myself. When I was in Manchester, you know, I was in Manchester from end of 96 to 2000. So I used to do PhD in moral philosophy. I also was a mom of Manchester Islamic Institute. I used to give lectures every Thursday, especially. We had weekly lectures. So never in five years that I was a mom, I talked about my PhD in a Thursday night. It could be much easier for me to speak to people about my PhD, which was relevant to them, moral philosophy, it was easier for me. And it could be also something as a kind of, you know, pride, you know, I say, people know I'm, you know, studying these serious things. But never, ever, I talked about my PhD. Once a brother came to our department, he was doing PhD in law, he came to our department, and he saw me there and he realized my position there. He said, why you don't talk about these things in the masjid? I said, I don't need to talk about these things in masjid. I should talk in the masjid about the things that people need. Things that are useful for them. Not the things that are easier for me. It's very important. 
A speaker should know what benefits people, what they need, not what you know is easy for me or what I have been working in the last few days, for example, last few weeks. It's easy, it's ready. No. You have to see what people need and how to present it. You have to present the way that they can understand, they can benefit, they can digest. And sometimes I tease, you know, some of our brothers in Jose. I say the prophets spoke to people according to the level. And we have also to speak to people according to the level. But the difference is they had to bring the level of their communication down. We sometimes we have to raise our level so that we can talk to the people. Because nowadays you are talking to people that are very educated. So if you want to speak to a group that the majority of them have degrees or postgraduate degrees, they have lots of experiences. So you have to speak according to their level, not by lowering your level, by raising your level. One of our teachers, Ayatollah Ahmed Imiyanadi Rahmatullah, they used to tell us when we were young, the maximum literacy for people was nine years in the school. You know, in Iran, we used to call it Sikh. Sikh means cycle. So if someone was able to finish nine years, we were saying that he has Sikh, which was very important. You know, if you go back 30 years ago, to have nine years is very important. Then became diploma. 12 years. And it was very important. Even we had, you know, for example, they said this person has diploma mardudi. Means he has studied 12 years but didn't pass the exam. As it was important that he has studied 12 years but didn't pass the final exam. Then to have a bachelor became the norm. But nowadays in Iran, even bachelor is not average. Many people have masters, many people have PhDs. So, he used to tell us, you have to prepare yourself for a time that when you give lecture to people, many of them would have postgraduate studies, many of them have PhDs. So you have to prepare yourself for that time. Anyway, we have to adjust our communication to the level of people, sometimes by lowering, sometimes by raising. But what is important, you adjust yourself according to the level of people, not vice versa. And you say, I can only speak like this. Whether you understand it or not, it's your problem. No. This is also your problem. Because you are to serve people and not people serve the speaker. Anyway, so to all the prophets, this was given as a task, that they should speak to people in their language, according to the level. And also, among these prophets, there were some who were given a special message. Many of prophets, they were not Rasul, they were just Nabi. 124,000 Nabi. How many Rasul? Only 313. So every Rasul is Nabi, but every Nabi is not Rasul. Okay? Every Nabi is not Rasul, but every Rasul is Nabi. Nabi is the one who receives revelation, but maybe through revelation he is not given a new book, a new Sharia, a new message. He just is given knowledge about the book which is given to the last prophet. Among Bani Israel, there were many prophets, sometimes even at the same time. There were many prophets living together. Even as you know, the Quran tells us about killing of many prophets. And according to some hadith, one day in the early morning, 70 prophets were killed. 
And then after they killed in the early morning 70 prophets, they went and opened their shops and business was normal. And God punished them for this. They killed many prophets. So it shows that sometimes there were many prophets at the same time. But it's not that everyone has his own book. Everyone has his own Sharia. They were preaching the last book and the last Sharia, which was given before them or at the same time. For example, Harun was living with Prophet Musa. And he was also a prophet. But Harun didn't have his book. Yeah, he had to follow the Torah which was given to Musa. So, 124,000 prophets, 313 Rasul. So, Rasul is higher than Nabi. We have, for example, hadith that Ibrahim first was chosen as a Nabi, then he became Rasul. Then he became Khalid. So there are levels. Out of these 313, which are the select, we have five which are the select of the select. And those are called Ulul Azm. Fasbir, Kama, Sabara, Ulul Azm, Minar Rusul. So, Ulul Azm Minar Rusul. So, among the Rusul, messengers or apostles, five of them are Ulul Azm. Nuh alayhi salam, Ibrahim alayhi salam, Musa alayhi salam, Isa alayhi salam, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. These are Ulul Azm. The prophets and messengers of very high determination. You may say, is it possible for a prophet not to be Ulul Azm? What's the answer? Yeah. Yes. It's possible. When it comes to Adam alayhi salam, Allah says, Lam najad lahu azman. Lam najad lahu azman. We didn't find determination in Adam. Determination is a gift that only those five had it at its best. Okay, let's have a break and inshallah we will start again. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alam.